Okay, so we are here with Kenny Kerner today, and of course, Kiss fans know the name because he was producer of you know the first two Kiss albums, Kiss, Kiss, and of course, Hotter Than Hell. But uh, so, so Kenny, how are you doing? I'm doing well. We're in uh, Los Angeles, and it's 85 to 90 degrees. Wish you were here. Ah, so do uh, I. This is the middle. This is the middle of our winter. Yeah, what a tough, what a tough winter you've had. Uh, I'm out east in Montreal, and uh, I've got snow up to my uh, belly button, pretty much, and it's it's unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Unbelievable. Reminds me of reminds me of my youth in Brooklyn, man. I Uh, miss it. Well, you know, Brooklyn's it's a great little uh, great little city, or part of a great city. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I, I think fans and Kiss fans know the name associated with these Kiss albums, but what they don't know is where have you been essentially for the last 39 years? So let's get caught up. What are you doing these days? Where, where can people find you? Are you still producing? What, you know, I, I've heard about I, this. I, well, go ahead. I don't produce anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm, do, I'm working on two projects. Right. I'm finishing up my autobiography. Oh, good. Which is called... Uh, I discovered Kiss, my life and the music business. Okay. Um, I hope to have that out by the end of this year. It's one of those uh, works in progress where every time I think I'm finished, something else comes to mind. Yeah. You know, I had lunch with Richie just two days ago, and we had like a three hour lunch right. and reminiscing and talking. And I should have brought a pad and pen because. So many more stories came to light. I have to go back now and add to the book. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that if that'll ever be finished. Is, is that and, a is that a Kiss <clears throat> book in particular with with a lot of focus on Kiss, or is it a book really about your life with a with a small section up front about working with Kiss? Oh, it, well, it says specifically on the back of the book, this is not a book about Kiss. Okay. Um, the, the the reason I did that was actually for the recognition. If I just called it my life in the music business, people would go, well, who's Kenny Kerner? Right, right. I mean, outside people. Everybody in the industry knows me. Right. But if I call it I discovered Kiss, my life and the music business, you know, a regular kid, musician, fan of music would see it and go, oh, now, you know, I put two and two together and hopefully buy the book. See. But it's clearly on the back of the book it says this is not a book solely about kids. Okay, but there is kids content. Now, now, the other thing that I know you're doing is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's just called Cool School? It's called The Cool School okay. for Music Business Studies. Okay. And all my life, I've been really fucking pissed off about how many of these colleges rip off students, musicians, make them take twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in financial aid, Right. Make them commit for a year or two years. They wind up dropping out of school so they could get a job at Starbucks and start paying back these loans. I got incredibly pissed and decided to do something about it. So my best friend, Chris Fletcher, who I've worked with at Musicians Institute for 10, 12 years, right. she and I decided we're going to start our own school. And we started a place called the Cool School for Music Business Studies. Every other Saturday, we give lectures on music business stuff. Now, now by, did, well, I was going to say, by music business, do you mean, you know, copyright law and, and, and you know, that kind of stuff? Or are you talking about... I mean, how- every, I mean everything except performing on an instrument. Okay. If you, if you are a guitar player, a vocalist, or interested in becoming a personal manager, you need to know how to navigate the music industry. You need to know the basics of the music business. That's why we teach. How does publishing work? How can I make money as a musician? What is personal management? How to survive as an independent artist? How to promote my music through social media? How to network in the music business? Every other Saturday, another topic. They're all taught by industry professionals, and they start at 2.30 Pacific time. They're about two hours long, and we charge the incredibly high price of $20 to get in. 
Now, and, and can people join you online also? Can, can, they, can they tune in and watch it? The, eventually, they will be able okay. to. Uh, we're getting that. We just started three weeks ago. Oh, great. So uh, what they could do in the meantime is email coolschoolbiz at yahoo.com. Okay. And give us their email address. We will send them a brochure. We will send them a list of upcoming uh, topics. And all they want to do uh, is pick a topic and email us and say, uh, I'm coming to the uh, March 29th lecture on um, how to succeed as an independent artist. And we reserve a seat for them. They show up at the door, and it's 20 bucks. Now, now if they course, don't want to go to any more, that's cool. Right. We don't take attendance. We don't give homework. We don't make them buy books. There's no commitment. You go to the lectures you want to go to, and it's only twenty dollars. So, so it's a little bit like TED Talks, but for music business, right? And do you? And right. of course, the the question that I I need to know is: Do you teach them about that big word in the music business, recoupment costs? We teach them about everything. <laughs> they just have to pick the lecture they want to go to. Oh, that's great. Um, so first I, first, I have to teach them how to spell recoupment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and then a, we could go from there. Yeah, that that seems to be the one word that gets a lot of the young artists. It's, they go, "What? What? I made a million. What do you mean I owe you one point two in recoupment costs? Hey, what's that? What's that?" Um, right, right. Yeah, so it's a cool music bid. Another uh, yeah. another good one is cross collateralization. I oh, see. I don't even know that one, but that 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 sounds oh, painful. Oh, you see, that sounds painful. No, oh, I, that's the worst one. Uh, no, I, I that's. A, that's where the record company says to you, well, you, uh, you owe the label $2 million, uh, and, but you only made a $1 million in royalties, so we're going to take the rest out of your publishing income. Oh, doesn't that, that that's a nice how, how you doing. Yeah, no, I, that's right. That's cross-collateralization, where they get the money from other areas of your income. Oh. <laughs> Neat. Is there is there a class on uh, a million ways to get screwed in the music business? <laughs> there will be a never ending class. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. I, you know, I I had a chance to put out a couple of CDs in 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 my time, and I learned all about shrinkage and recoupment costs and all this stuff. And you go, oh, okay. How about I make something? And you just pay me for it. How about that? No. That doesn't shrinkage. Work. Isn't yeah. shrink something that happens when you go into cold water? <laughs> Only on Seinfeld episodes. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> so um, that was hilarious. That that was, but there, so you got the cool music biz at yahoo.com. Is there a website? There's a website which is uh, http right. colon slash slash www dot the cool school. Dot biz, B-I-Z. B-I-Z, okay, so good. That's so the website. I'm going to make sure that uh, not only is it mentioned, but I'm going to make sure that graphic is thrown up on the screen so when people tune in and watch this and get to the website, they'll, they'll, they'll see this. Now, let, That's let's... great, thank let, you. Let's, 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 let's dig back into the past for a little bit. Let, let's start with... Well, let's start with the book title. I mean, it says, I discovered Kiss. Okay, <laughs> how so? Uh, Let's well, go back to 1972, a, 1973. Okay, so just as a footnote, mm -hmm. uh, in, in my office, on my wall, is hanging a color lithograph of Gene Simmons' solo album. Okay. Remember all four of them put out solo records the same day? You're going to find this silly, but I actually have Gene's solo album in front of me because I was talking to oh, okay. uh, I was talking to Alan Schwartzberg, who played drums on it the other day, and I had taken it out just to reference something, so I have it standing right in front of me. Okay, so it's a big close-up of his head yep. with his tongue, Yep. and he, he blew that up, or the label did. Wow. He gave me a blown-up lithograph of that. And at the very bottom in the white space, he took a Sharpie, a red Sharpie, and he wrote to Kenny, you heard it before anyone. Thanks, Gene Simmons. Wow. So, so, so let's so start right I have there. that. The story is as follows. 
I had a job uh, as a music journalist at a magazine called Cashbox. Yes, a very famous magazine. Which is just like magazine. Billboard. Right. Yeah, it's just like Billboard. And um, I had started producing records for Neil Bogart. Right. Uh, with Richie. Uh, most of the records were for Buddha Kama Sutra, which is the label he was president of. Right. At the same time he was running Buddha Kama Sutra, he was finalizing a deal for Casablanca Records right. through Warner Brothers. Neil's problem in the music industry was he could never find a rock band, legitimate, streetwise, that the fans would just admire, admire. and buy millions of records. Can I ask one you question could, in between? Yeah. Um, when I spoke to Richie a couple of weeks ago, he told me that at the time he was 22 years old. How old were you when, when you were starting to produce and, and work with Kiss and all? And you had, you had produced the Dust record before that, right? Yeah, I was, I'm about, I think, a year or two older than Richie. Wow, it, it's amazing to think that, you know, at 22 and I guess at 24... Here you are producing these records for, for Neil Bogart because, you know, in 2014, you think of a record producer, you think of somebody who's 50, who's 60, you know, maybe 40 you know, if, uh, if they're young. But Richie and I had lunch a couple of days ago, and to be honest with you, I was fucking amazed at the adventures we went through yeah. at such an early, uh, just one after another. You know, just one, I mean, for me, Richie stayed in production, right. but after after we stopped producing together, uh, I was a successful publicist. Right. Um, I represented Body by Jake, Michael J. Fox, Jay Leno. Oh, really? At, at a PR company. I was a senior editor of um, Rock Scene, Metal Mania, Concert Shots, and Music Connection for nine or ten years. I wrote two books. I taught at UCLA Extension. I taught at Musicians Institute for 16 years. Wow. I worked at O'Coin Management. I just went just on and on and on. And everything I did was like incredible success. And I have no fucking schooling. I just did this from instinct and passion. Well, that's you know, amazing. We were just sitting there. We were just sitting. We did the, bar, the Bad Finger album. Yeah. Richie and I were standing in the fucking middle of Apple Studios. Studio A, or the Beatles, looking at Paul McCartney's Baby Grand Piano, the one he recorded all those Beatles albums on. Right, right, right. Oh my God! Just standing there, and then we hear a voice coming over the talkback, going, "Tenny Richie, come on into the control room," and it's fucking Jeff Emmerich, nice, the Beatles engineer. <laughs> who was engineering the album with us. And we looked at each other and was like, you know, I expected to see Rod Serling any second. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, what the fuck are we doing here? It's like a Twilight you Zone know? episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was completely surreal. And Jeff would go, well, there's where Ringo set up his drums. I'm going, fuck me, what is this? <laughs> you know, there's John's guitar slot and, and George's. A quick story. Badfinger came in. Right. Tom, Tommy, Tommy, the bass player, uh, came into the studio. He was the first one in there and introduced himself. And the first thing we say to him, Tommy, you got to tell us a Beatles story because they worked with the Beatles. The Beatles produced some of their tracks. And Tommy says, um, let me see. Oh, I've got a good one. I came into the studio once and I put my stuff down and I hear Paul at the piano, right here in the studio. And I walk in and he turns around and goes, Tommy, Tommy, come here, I gotta play something for you. And I walked over, I said, hey Paul, how are you? And he goes, I just finished this song, let me know what you think. And Tommy said, okay, I said, okay, let me hear it. And he turns around to the piano and he goes, hey Jude, don't make it. And, wow. and he played the whole, the whole song, hey Jude. Oh, that's unbelievable. And I, and and I turned to Tom and I said, you couldn't possibly have had anything to say. And he said, no, I couldn't, I, I, was, I couldn't speak. Oh, that's, just, a, that's an incredible story. What do you, what do you say? Uh, the chorus needs some work, Paul. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, 
The guy yeah. played the first one in the world to hear Hey Jude. And he asks you what you think. Yeah, you say, oh, you need to fix the bridge. It's not working right now. <laughs> that no, no, no part at the end has got to go. Yeah, be more yeah. positive. Go with yeah, yeah, yeah instead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, could, so, you, could you imagine? No, I can't. It's an un un unbelievable uh, trip it was for us. Uh, yeah, so know, anyway, but, so, I was so he, working at I was working at Cashbox, right. which was like Billboard, right? And they're looking for a rock and, band. Yeah, looking. Neil was looking for a rock band for Casablanca because he had no rock bands on Buddha Kama Sutra, and because Richie and I had had a couple of hit records as producers with him already, he would leave every Friday a box of demo tapes right outside his office door, right with the understanding that after I got out of cash box at 5 o'clock, I would walk over to his office, I would pick up the tapes, slip them back on the D train to my apartment in Brooklyn, listen to them over the weekend, and if there was anything good, bring them into his office. Otherwise, I'd leave the box there Monday morning and right. go to work. I listened every week, every Friday, for God knows how many weeks, week after week after week, all... I heard was shit. Garbage. Yeah. And then I took the box home on usual Friday. I got down on the floor. I spread the packages out. I took one at a time, put them on my reel-to-reel, -reel, because that's all we had then. Right. Reel-to-reel -reel or cassette. Most of them were reel-to-reel tapes. And I opened this one package, and I pulled out a picture. And it was a picture of a black and white okay. of four guys wearing what looked like kabuki makeup, right? and each one had a design on his face in the makeup, and they were wearing a uh, turtleneck shirt, you know, like the kind you buy at Target or right. whatever. Right. Five bucks, a black turtleneck shirt. And I was always into marketing because okay. I did dust. Right. And we did dust buttons and dust fan club cards and... We sold our own concert tickets and everything. So I was like the Bill Graham of Brooklyn. Right. I totally got it. I saw the picture and I said, okay, great, a gimmick, something to sell, marketing. And I took out the tape and I saw Eddie Kramer. And I said, oh, great, Eddie, I worked with Eddie before. Right. Electric Lady, yeah, I worked at that studio with Eddie. I put the tape on and I hear fucking strutter. Cold Gin, Firehouse, yeah. uh, I hear Black Diamond, and I, I take the tape off, I listen to, I rewind, I listen to it again, and I go, this is fucking great. This is real rock and roll, real street cred, okay. exactly what Neil is looking for. Okay, so you got it right away, because, I mean, you, you listen to some of the stories and you get... Oh, well, Kiss was dismissed because they had the gimmick and the makeup and, and the music was simplistic. But you put it on and right away you went, oh, I knew, okay. I, I knew, I knew it immediately. Okay. I put the, I, Monday morning, I brought the tape back to Neil. Uh, net, I put the box outside his office. Right. And I walked right into his office with the Kiss demo tape. And I said, this was in the box I just brought back. You need to sign this band immediately to Casablanca. The songs are great. They all have hooks. The band has a marketing angle. This is your credible rock band. Okay. And now, I'm sure Bill O'Coin had a tape also. Right. I'm sure, Bo he gave, I'm sure he gave it to Bogart or played it for Bogart. I think what made Neil act on it was the fact that I mean, what is Bill going to say? The band sucks, sign them? He manages the guy. Right, of course. But I think when he heard it from me, he heard it from somebody who was not attached to the band. He was hearing it from a hit producer for his label already. Right. So my opinion had production credibility. But you were also a manager at that time, were you not? You 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 had been managing Dust, or or did I have? That I had wrong? been managing Dust, okay. right? So so you had. But I was not affiliated with Kiss. Of course. Bill was. Okay. So I go back to Cashbox, and a day later he calls me, and he says, 
I set up this uh, showcase for Kiss at Latang. It's a small dance studio. Right. Bring Richie. We're all going to be there. We show up. Everybody from uh, all of Neil's relatives are there. He was very nepotistic. He staffed his labels with his relatives. Right. So he has three, he, the three or four people he was going to bring to Casablanca were there with Neil, with Bill O'Coin, and his partner, Joyce Biowitz, right. who later became Joyce Biowitz Bogart. And what a fucking story I have to tell you about that. Oh. And me and Richie were there. You know, you know the expression, bigger than a shoebox? Yeah, I do. This, this rehearsal room was the shoebox. Okay. Or smaller it than. So, it was, right, smaller than. Right. It was so small, the stage was so low, <clears throat> excuse me, that I was afraid for the guys. You know, I was, I, I was afraid if Paul stood, you know, because they had these heels. Right. If Paul stood up and jumped up to start a song, I had this vision of his head sticking into the ceiling above him. <laughs> he could, you couldn't stand upright on the stage. But they played easily 140, 150 decibels loud. Like it was a jet deafening. airplane. <clears throat> yeah. But, okay, he so did his usual tongue and walked into the audience making people clap. They did about a half hour. But they had the full makeup. And, uh, did they have the fire yes. bombs and all that too? No, they had uh, no pyro as far okay. as I know. Okay. Are you kidding? Pyro would have, would have set that room ablaze in a second. Okay. Okay. So they did everything. About a half hour set, they put their instruments down. Uh, we were all standing in the back of the room because there was really no more room to sit. Okay, so me and Neil and Richie and Bill were standing in the back of the room, leaning against the door. Gene and Paul put their instruments down. They come to the back of the room, and Neil says, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, I'd like you to meet Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise. They're producing your first album for Casablanca. Were they excited, or were they like, who the hell are these people? Well, it was as big a surprise to us as it was to them. Okay. Because he didn't say anything to any one of us. He just, you know, you knew when you saw the showcase, this was, was going to be a giant band. Okay. You know? So... Now, so I, don't, I don't know if Neil looked at it from the point of view of, here's, here's uh, something I could market because of the makeup... Or he really got the music. Okay. You know, it was probably a combination of both. Because you did try to fuck with them later on with, you know, give me a hit single and, you know, forcing kissing time on the album. Yeah, I want, I but want that's to get... how it ha that's, that's how it happened. So from that moment until you actually walked into the studio door for day one of the sessions, how long was it? Was it a week, six months? Uh, what was the timeline approximately? Uh, I, I don't remember. I'm no good with dates. I can tell you the first album took about a week. Okay. But, but, <clears> from, the, from, but from the showcase to the studio album, or from the showcase to the recording session, I mean, did, was the showcase in July and the album started in November? Or was it you saw them in July and you started in July kind of thing? I couldn't answer, if you held a gun to my head, Wouldn't I couldn't know. answer that. Okay, so... Richie's, Richie's good with that shit. Uh, I do know that our procedure as producers... Right. ...was we always used to have them play all their songs for us at a rehearsal... Okay. ...and pick the ones we wanted to, but we had this demo tape now, we could easily say, well, you know, here's six songs right off the bat we want to do, what else do you got? Okay. So it, it was probably... It was, it, was, it definitely wasn't six or seven months. It was probably, you know, three, four weeks at the most and just to pick the songs. <clears throat> do, do you remember, other than the songs, the ten songs that are on the album, if there was an extra ten that were recorded or an extra ten that they rehearsed for you or, or, or presented to you? We, we, we usually ask them to play all the songs they have, but we never, ever... And uh, this is another lesson in music business. Right. We never recorded more songs. We never recorded in the studio more songs than we were going to put on the album. Okay. Because the record company owns them. Right, got so you. If, you record, uh, <clears throat> if you're a producer and you record 15 songs and you say to the artist, we're going to put 10, pick the best 10, those other five songs belong to the record company. So five years later, when you leave that label... 
Guess who's putting out an album of unreleased material? Right. And, and by the way, that's a good point that you bring up because a lot of fans, you know, of Kiss or any band always say, why don't they do a box set with all the demos? And it's like, well, they don't own those. And if they're not on that right. label anymore, you can. Right. Because it's, it's sort of a, a work for hire kind of situation where, you know, they're paying for the studio time. So whatever comes out of it. They own it, folks. Exactly, exactly right. Um, so, so, how did you devise the the first album, or what was your thought going in? So, you had the demo, the Eddie Kramer, Eddie Kramer demos. You had the seen them at Latang, right? What kind of sound? I mean, did did Kiss come in with a sound, and you just threw it on tape, or did you mold it somehow? Richie and I um, had a really uh, unique relationship. Okay. As a production team, right. He was really into the techni, the techie area of it. Okay. You know, give me two more dB here. Let's do this. Let's do that. I was into the business end of it. Okay. I didn't want to be an engineer, so Richie and I would talk, and in the studio, he would be the one to communicate with the engineer. I would be the one to communicate with Richie. Okay. And what we decided was before we even got into the studio. This had to sound credible, okay. it had to sound real, it had to sound raw. Okay. And so we decided to record it almost all live <clears throat> in the studio. Okay, great. With as few overdubs as possible, just vocals. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's what we did. The, so the, it, was it was basically live in the studio, and this way no, no gimmicks, you know, nobody could say anything about, oh, it's Neil again with his, he doctored up the album in the studio with Curtin and Wise, and they made the band sound really good, but they suck. There was none of that. This was Kiss. Okay, and, and, and so let, let's talk a little bit about the players then. As they came in and you got to see Gene and Paul, did, did, how did they strike you? Did, did Gene and Paul have a very straight-on <clears throat> forward vision of what the band was going to be? Um, how, you know, how, how did you view them in terms of musicianship? Is Gene a good bass player? Is Peter a good drummer? Did, did you have any thoughts on that? I thought Gene, uh, Gene and Paul were, were okay. Ace was okay. Okay. Peter, Peter had a timing problem, a really serious timing problem. Okay. But I mean... And that's... Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, but that that's... I think that's part of what makes Kiss great is that it is sort of loose and I don't want to say sloppy, but but it isn't this technical sort of prog rock kind of thing. It, it, it's loosey-goosey and that, that's what sort of makes it fun, right? Yeah, there's, there's Kiss and then there's Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. if you want to see a real technically proficient fucking spot-on van that could stop on a dime, right. you go see Yes. If you want to go have fun and party and dance and hear some great rock and roll with a great, you go see Kiss, yeah, and absolutely. that's what Neil needed at the time. He needed a really the 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 quintessential rock and roll band, you know, and that's what he got. And that's that's what why he got. we did the album, you know, so live. <clears throat> now, now, so when you put the album out or put it together the first time, there was nine songs on it, and then Neil comes to you and says. Boy, we need to do kissing time, and we need to throw it in there somehow. Um, yeah. Now, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Was kissing time recorded more along the when hotter than hell was done, or was there a special session between the two albums where kissing time was done? And sort of what were your what was your thoughts about that? Because a lot of people say, oh, "Why did we do that?" Um. It was one of the uh, ingredients that uh, made Kiss and Bill and me decide to pull the band off Casablanca. Okay. Because he lied to them about that. He told them he would never make them do any cover songs, and he would never force any songs on their records. Kiss, uh, Neil... His whole career, God bless him. Right. Okay. Ningle, uh, Ningle, Bogart was the king of singles. Right. He could take 
a single called You're a Piece of Shit and sell 10 million copies with it. But you put that on an album, and he was lost. Okay. So, the album sold, when all the smoke cleared, about 150,000 copies. But there was no hit single on it to put it over the top. Right. There were a lot of songs that could have been single. Strutter could have been a single. Oh, absolutely. He, he released Nothing to Lose, which I thought was the wrong single. But almost every song could have been a single. He didn't know how to promote rock and roll singles. So the only thing he could come up with was, oh, let's do a cover. Why? Why Kissing Time? Because there was a fucking gimmick attached to it. Neil it was the king of gimmicks, the king right. of hype. So if you do a song called Kissing Time, you have a kissing contest. With a band named Kiss, right? Duh, you see? <laughs> See how stupid? And that went completely opposite his concept of a real street cred band. Because once you have a band with street credibility and you start doing that shit, there goes their credibility. Yeah. Straight you know, off. If, if, if radio programmers initially, initially didn't like them because of the makeup, how much more are they going to be hated once they release Kiss in Time? Yeah, it seems sort of a strange concept because here you've got these, they're, they're in the leather and they've got the makeup and Gene's, <coughs> Gene especially there, especially if you look back at like the Mike Douglas show and stuff, he was overselling this demon persona and yep. they're doing this happy little sort of teeny bopper <laughs> kissing time song. It, I mean, didn't that hurt the image at the, in the long run where it's, it's like... Totally, it, it completely backfired. Richie and I refused to do it, and Neil basically threatened us. He said, hey, I signed your checks. We need to do this. I need a single. We went into the studio, and after the band went ballistic, we sat around the control room, about eight of us, the four guys in the band, me, Richie, the engineer, uh, Sean Delaney, I believe, right. and we rewrote the song in about five minutes. I took a pad and a pen, and I said, okay, we're rewriting these songs. We're kissing in, you know, and Paul would say, Detroit. And I'd write, okay, we're kissing in Detroit. We had the original Bobby Rydell version. We just rewrote it to put in more rock lyrics. Right. But still. Neil, Neil gets the record. He releases it, starts the kissing contest, and the fucking thing backfired. Everybody in the world covered the kissing contest. Lines, cameras filming lines and lines of guys kissing their girlfriends for hours and days and weeks. Nobody fucking related it to the band Kiss. So, there, yeah. was a, there was no mention of, based on the rock group Kiss on Casablanca Records, President Neil Bogle has initiated this endless kissing concert. Nothing. It was kissing, 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 kissing. No mention of kiss. <laughs> right, it was, and I think it was it was being held across malls across the state. So they're like, there's these crazy kids in malls kissing. We, <laughs> what what's going on with America's youth? Um, yeah. You, you mentioned Sean Delaney, and he was there, of course. Um, what can you tell me about Sean? Because uh, you know, a lot of people sort of consider him to be the fifth member or the sixth member of Kiss. Um, was he in the studio giving you guidance and saying, okay, this needs more of this and more guitar here? Or, or, or what was his role? Or was he just a casual observer? Uh, Richie and I produced records by ourselves. Okay. Uh, he was not in the studio giving us guidance. Okay. Uh, the only one who was in the studio occasionally giving us guidance was Clive Davis when we did an album for Columbia. Okay. Uh, and... You kind of listen to Clive Davis. You know what I mean? Right. But, um... Because he'll make no, or break Sean, you. What? Because Clive will make or break you. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, he had Sean that... was... I was just going to say, he had that fight recently in the last few years with Kelly Clarkson, who, who was that American Idol winner, and she said, yeah. I want to go more rock, and he said, no, you're not, and then her career essentially died after he sort of pulled the plug on her, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, he could do that. Sean couldn't. 
Right. So, so, so Sean basically helped choreograph the band okay. and gave them tips about performing and got them to really focus in on their persona, the characters they were portraying, and I'm sure he helped with their costumes, and he was dating Bill O'Coin. Okay. You know, so um, you couldn't dismiss Sean because that was like insulting Bill, and he was very valuable and very talented in that regard. But he never once, you know, came into the studio and said, more guitar, less guitar, okay. you know. What, was, was Bill O'Coin present? Not necessarily giving you hints or anything, but was he just in the studio saying, I want to see my band and let's, let's make sure we get this right? Or, or was Bill sort of hands-off and you'd send him the tapes every couple of weeks? Bill, Bill never forced anything. Okay. First of all, I have to say that uh, I've been in the, in the music business 45 years, right. and there is nobody that I have more regard for than Bill O'Coin. Oh, absolutely. Bill was uh, a genius and should be, I don't know how they missed this, but he should have been nominated with Kiss to be elected in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He, everything I learned about personal management and working with artists, I learned from Bill. Uh, he was passionate, compassionate, understanding, and just had a brilliant, brilliant mind. He wasn't into fucking artists or deceiving them or ripping them off. He was a true artist manager. And very few people know this, but Bill and I were really, really close friends. And all the artists that he wanted to sign to management, right. he would send me first. He would send me a CD or a, or a, well, a tape and, and say, Kenny, do me a favor. I'm thinking about managing these guys. Check them out. I would listen to the music. I would check their websites, look at all the pictures, listen to every song, and email him a full report you know, before he went and signed the band. So we were doing that kind of in a very stealth manner. Right. But I, he, 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 I miss him dearly. Now, he was just an amazing person. Did you send him reports uh, <clears throat> after you started working with Kiss, or did you know him before working with Kiss, and, and therefore did you send him a report on Kiss? No, he got, he got the Kiss album... Uh, probably from Gene. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing probably from Gene. Um, Bill and I worked on another project, a band that I put together. Uh, this was after Kiss was already recording, a band that Gene produced uh, against my wishes, but it was a band I put together, a, a teen pop band called Virgin. Yeah, you know, I don't remember And I, I, I managed them. It took me a year and a half to find the guys. You know, I was, always, I was always amazed by the charts, and I studied the Billboard charts. And I realized that every year there'd be another Teen Idol, yeah. and they didn't even have to do their own songs. Donny Osmond, all, going all the way back to Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Bobby Darin, Donny, Marie, the Osmonds, Bo Donaldson and the Haywoods, Menudo, Sean Cassidy, David Cassidy, the Partridge family, Leif Leif Garrett. Garrett, and on, <laughs> Leif Garrett, and on and on and on. So I put together this five-piece rock and roll band called Virgin, and I managed them. They rehearsed five or six songs, and I said, I'm going to bring in Bill O'Coin to co-manage them with me. I brought Bill in. <clears throat> they did two songs, and he says, I want to manage you. We co-managed them. He says, I'm going to bring in a producer to see if he wants to produce you. He brings in Michael Lloyd, who produced all those artists. The Cassidy's, the Osmonds, right. Leif Garrett. <clears throat> Michael comes in and he hears them do their five-song set. And he goes, um, I, can't, I can't sign them right now because um, he was affiliated with Curb Records, Michael Curb's label. Right says, I can't sign them right now because I'm going out on the road, but what we really need is Sean Cassidy is going out on the road for the first time. The Hardy Boys, the Hardy Boys TV show just ended. 
He's had two platinum albums and three hit singles. He's finally going on tour. We need an opening act, and Virgin would be absolutely perfect to open the tour. Long story short, we did a 44-city Sean Cassidy tour as the opening act. Wow. What a, what a combination. First, wait, listen to this. <laughs> the first gig that Virgin ever played in their lives was at the Salt Palace in Utah right. in front of 15,000 people. <sighs> That's not a bad that way to start your gig. That was first gig. gig. They were getting bags of mail that had to be brought up on a hand cart to the O'Coin office. They were in every national and international teen magazine. They, on the road, they had bodyguards, each one of them. That's how big they were. That's un and, and, you know, I, I've, I've been a follower of rock since the early 70s, and, and, you know, I followed Kiss and Aerosmith and Cheap Trick. I don't think I've ever heard of Virgin. I'm going to have to go look that up. But you know what? I've never been into the whole... It's because they never released a record. Oh, there you go. So, so they, they, just, they cut, just were... They, they cut one single on Curb Records, a cover of uh, Here Comes My Baby, and Mike Curb decided he was giving up the label and running for lieutenant governor of California. Right. So the record never came out. Oh, so it doesn't even exist. So, so they're playing to 15,000 people, and they basically don't exist on vinyl anywhere. Or, and they had no merchandise. <sighs> unbelievable. That's, that, that's right. That's unbelievable. Um, let, let me get you quickly back here to, to Kiss for a second. The album is now 40 years old. It came out in February of 74. Uh, have you listened to it recently? And what are your thoughts in terms of the production? Do you think I did a great job or, oh, my God, I could have fixed this, I could have fixed that? I, I, I really think it holds up. Yeah, absolutely. If you, consider, if you consider what it's supposed to be. Right. You know, and uh, I don't like the second album. Yeah, and I want I to get like over to... I don't like Out of Hell. Good, because that, that, that's... I, a... I, like the first, I like the first one. Um... I thought the cover of the first one could have been a little more imaginative. True. But, uh, I mean, I had nothing to do with the cover. It was sort of copying the Beatles album, right, with just those yeah, four course, faces. Yeah, of course, why, why would you copy a, a, a group like that? They're not even in the same genre. It's not even an obvious cop. <clears throat> I just thought it was all black and, you know, it could have done more. But, you know, looking back on it 40 years, I mean, other than Peter Chris, uh, Peter Chris's makeup, which is sort of strange on the Kiss cover, it is an iconic kind of image. Right. All I'm saying is, for example, if I had done that same cover, right. the background would have been white. And What's the it? reason is because the black would have popped right off the cover. With that contrast, would have been a contrast. Yeah, that that's actually that's interesting. Yeah, I don't like black on black because everything just sort of runs into each other. Yeah, it just fades. You know, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, and that's I what you see on the cover. Top. What? When that's what you see with the cover. All you really see is the white of the makeup. Everything else is just blended into sort of a, a, a continuous background kind of thing. Yeah, so, I don't know. So, so let's knock me out. Let's look at Hotter Than Hell. You know, there, there, there has been this discussion, especially among KISS fans, that the production was muddy and that, it, it, you know, the drums were sort of not, you know, the, the drums were messy. And why don't you like Hotter Than Hell, the album? Uh, I don't like it for two main reasons. Okay. Uh, I can't talk about the production because, number one, I'm too close to it. Okay. Could we make it better today? Of course. Sure. Uh, are the drums too muddy? Uh, in whose opinion? Right. You, you know what I mean? That's a never-ending discussion. Right. But I don't like it because I do not like the cover. Again, I don't get the cover at all. Uh, and number two, uh, I don't like the songs. Really? But what's wrong with the that, songs? I don't think they're as good as the songs on the first album. <clears throat> uh, you know what? As a fan, I'll agree to that. I, I think the first album should have just been called Best Of or Greatest Hits because 40 years if, later... If you, go, if you go see Kiss today, guarantee you they'll be doing almost 
every song off that first album. Yeah. Oh, you're absolutely correct. And if you... those are iconic songs, absolutely. And there really, there really aren't that many on the second album. I mean, I don't even, I can't even name all the songs on the second album without looking. You know, but I just didn't like the songs. I didn't think they were strong. We knew we had to make. We we knew when we went into the studio, we had to show some kind of progress from the first album to the second album in terms of recording. Right. You know, we have to show that the group progressed somehow. But that, I think, is a natural, you know, a natural step. You know, I, I know back in, in the early 70s, doing two albums in a year was sort of par for course. But the first one, I, from what I gather, didn't sell as much as everybody had expected. Were there any pressures going into the second album of, yeah. you need to write a single, you need to do this, it has to be more heavy metal sounding to be dir you know, darker and dirtier to reflect the band? Were there any Neil, constraints? Neil, Neil, Neil gave us... No instructions okay. whatsoever. Okay. Nor did he ever say to us, we need to get a hit single. Okay. The problem was very simple. Right. Neil did not know, nor did his marketing team know, how to promote a fucking rock group. Okay. They had not done it before. They didn't have the machinery, the people in place to promote a fucking rock group. If you take KISS and put them on Atlantic Records, they'd be the biggest group in the world. Right. Because Atlantic knows how to promote Led Zeppelin yep. and Foreigner yep. and rock groups. Neil Bogart does not. Okay, so he, he didn't have... And that's why the group failed. Well, with those two albums, but then... But then I guess Neil eventually got it right when he said to them, go write that anthem, which ended up being Rock and Roll All Night on Dress to Kill. Um, but I guess he, it took, there was a learning curve for him, then I, I imagine, to, to get to that point where he said, okay. Right, and even, even, with, even with Rock and Roll All Night, right. Dress to Kill didn't sell 10 million copies. No. You know, it didn't sell more than the first two albums, really. I mean, comparatively speaking. So even with the hit single, he couldn't promote the fucking album properly. He just didn't have the machinery. What was your relationship with Kiss out of the studio? Did you go to the shows? Did you follow them? I mean, did you just do the album and then, okay, six months later, here they come again? Or did you try to... No, either... we, went to, we went to one or two shows, but okay. I mean, you know, the shows were different. Once the albums were out, they were doing tours. Okay. You know, they weren't to Coventry or, you know, Biltmore Hotel or whatever, or Diplomat Hotel. They were doing bigger venues, so... Because the, the, the you know, question... Sorry, the, the question I was trying to get at is, did you say, huh, what, what I'm hearing on the record is not what I'm hearing live. How do I get that live energy onto vinyl? Or, or did you not have any kind of thoughts like that? Um, well, we thought we did with the first okay. album. Uh, well, listen, I think you did. I think that album is, is spotless, quite frankly. You know, we saw the group live, and that's why we said, let's make it a live album. <clears throat> we did. And like I said, the second album, yeah, a little muddy here and there, but I mean, it's, um, you know, it's a matter of who's, you know, you play it for 10 people, you get 10 different opinions. The bottom line, the one constant is Neil Bogart couldn't promote a rock group. Okay, bro. Let, let me Period. ask you. No matter, no matter how that album would have sounded, he would still not have been able to promote the rock group. When when I asked Richie Wise what he thought of Hotter Than Hell, he, he essentially said he was embarrassed. Um, are you embarrassed by Hotter Than Hell? No, it's history. Okay. It's past history. It's done. It's over with. Okay. It is what it is. Now, and the, the other why, mis why did he say he's embarrassed? He just didn't like it, much like you. He just thought it wasn't a great record. <clears throat> he just thought... He, he's... He said that it didn't define him as a producer. He says he knows he's better than that. He knows he can do better. And if somebody comes to him and says, well, you produce this, he's embarrassed by it. I, I think that's very, very unfair of Richie to say that about himself. It's one thing to say, it's not my best work. Right. Of course now we were just starting to produce. Right. We only been producing a year or two when we did those albums. 
So obviously he got better and better and better sure. and did some great records. We did some amazing fucking records with Gladys Knight that sure. I'm sure he's really proud of. But, you know, it's a step at a time for an artist and a step at a time for producer development. I didn't like it because I didn't like the songs. Right. I didn't think the songs were as strong as the first album. Do you like the songs now? No, I'm not talking about the studio techie side of it. Right. You know, he could find fault with that as a techie, but, you know, to say he's, he's embarrassed by it, it wasn't his best work, you know, that's like Van Gogh saying, well, my first, uh, you know, color painting wasn't my best. <laughs> So, you know what I mean? But, but of do course you look, not. You got better as you went along. Do you look back 40 years later and think, eh, these songs are pretty good. You know, Parasite's got something going for it. Got to Choose is not so bad. Or do you still think the, the material just wasn't there? It's just not good it enough? It wasn't there. Okay. Okay. Now, the the other thing that, that, that KISS fans debate about often when it comes to Hotter Than Hell is the song Strange Ways. Apparently... Peter Chris had done this seven-minute or nine-minute drum solo and said, you better put it on the album or I'm out of this band. And then I asked Richie, and he said, I don't remember that. Um, do you remember any kind of story about the, uh, an excessive drum solo being included on Hotter Than Hell? Or, or I, I would like to know what drugs Peter was on when he thought he said that. <laughs> so, so there's no... And can, there's I, no... And can I get some? Yeah, kick can... Probably, actually, but th so there's no, there's no, there's no, there outstanding... there was never any single, he may have said that to Gene and Paul outside the studio, right? but I swear I have no recollection whatsoever of any lengthy drum solo called Strange Days or Strange Ways okay. or anything like that or any outburst by Peter demanding to put that on the record. Yeah, and let's be, quit. let's be very, very fair to Peter. Uh, this could also just be Kiss Urban Legend. I mean, th that's the story that's been floating around in Kiss World. for. Well, I, I'm qualified by saying, by saying to my recollection, right. I don't remember any outburst by Peter demanding to have, right. you know, a seven-minute drum solo yeah. uh, and, on the record. And, and I just want to qualify it by saying, Peter never told me this personally, so I can't quote him exactly, right. but, but that's the story. Um, so, so looking back on Hotter Than Hell, not as, not as pleased as the first. Now, you know, the, you had done good work, I think, uh, especially with the first one. Why weren't you invited to produce Dress to Kill or the third album? Ah... Uh. Uh -oh. Therein lies the top secret of the band. Am I allowed to hear it? <laughs> yes. Good. It's going to be in my autobiography. You may as well hear it. Good. Here's what happened. I'm listening. Bill and I were really pissed at Casablanca. Okay. For and what so reason? was the band. Was it a financial he reason? Do, he made them do Kissing Time. Okay wasn't really able to promote or market either album. Correct. And we knew that. The band was on tours. They didn't see it in places. You know, they had to... It just wasn't, you know... It wasn't marketed. They had no marketing department. Okay. Bill was made an offer by a major record company for a massive amount of money. Okay. To leave Casablanca and sign with this label. Okay. We had a secret meeting at my apartment in West Hollywood. Me and Gene and Paul and Richie and, and Bill and Joyce Biowitz. Okay. No Who Sean Delaney. At time, what? No. Okay. And at this time, Joyce was dating Neil Hot and Heavy. Right. At that meeting, we discussed the possibility of pulling the band off Casablanca and wow. signing with this other major label that was a rock label. Okay. Okay? We all voted to pull the band. Really? Wow. Yes. 
The next day, Neil Bogart calls me up and fires me and Richie as producers. Oh, because Joyce had squealed on you. He fucking went to bed with him <sighs> and told him what happened at the meeting. <sighs> he fires me and Richie as producers, has a meeting with the band, and tells them they need to fire Bill O'Coin. Ooh. Which didn't the band happen. Says, the band says to Neil, we can't do anything about Kenny and Richie because they don't work for us. They're independent producers. Right. But we're not leaving Bill. Okay. Neil says, okay, then, well, I'm producing the third album. And he went into the studio because he had no other producers. Right. He just fired us. And he's not a he producer himself. The, of course not. He went into the studio, he brought drugs into the studio for the band, he spent eight or nine hours in the studio on the telephone, didn't have a clue what was going on, and put out the Dress to Kill album, which, by the way, has a brilliant cover. Yes. And again, only a couple of good songs. Neil had no control over what was going on, and just put it out. And, and the end result is... They had what could have been, what turned out to be an anthem. Right. And again, the album didn't live up to the sales of, you know, having a semi-hit single on it. Because they couldn't market albums again. You know? Right. And that's why Alive did so well. It was the band Live, without interference from anybody, with nobody saying... Give me a hit single, give me a ballad, give me this, give me that. You know what I mean? You put microphones down, you record the band, nobody's fucking with anything, nobody's forcing songs on it. This is Kiss Alive. And the people went crazy. Right, and of course, you know, 40 years on or, or 38 years on from that record, we find out that Alive maybe wasn't as alive as everybody had first thought, well, right? Well, the... Neither was live at Leeds by The Who. Right. Townsend took the album back into the studio and redid a lot of the leads. You right. know, that, that's, par for, that's par for the course with uh, live albums. So, you, just, you take it back in the studio and you just tweak it a little bit. So, so then let me ask your opinion on this then. If, if the first album had all the great songs and the second one didn't have some great songs and the third one also... How do you think Kiss has managed to survive for 40 years? What, what is it about the band other than the songs that has, that has created a 40-year dynasty? The will to live. Okay. And the fact that they are probably the best live band in the world. I'll agree with that. And they're still great to this day. But a Absolutely. You go to a Kiss uh, uh, live show... You will fucking be entertained till the last moment, and you will not know what to expect. Do, do, yeah, no, I agree. Do you, um, do you still talk to either Gene or Paul or either Peter or Ace, or have you sorely fallen apart? No, so, sometimes we're all busy doing a million different things. Right. Sometimes you run into each other. Occasionally I'll meet Paul in a supermarket and we'll talk for five minutes. Once in a while, I'll see Gene at some kind of a fair or whatever, and we'll talk. I mean, when they see me, we recognize each other instantly. It's not like, don't I know you from somewhere? Right. <clears throat> you know, um, but, but we're, we're just, you know, we're just, I mean, really busy doing things and trying to stay alive and trying to stay relevant and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, all right, so let me ask you this then. Who do you credit more with Kissick's success? Bill O'Coin, Sean Delaney, Neil Bogart, Gene Simmons, or Paul Stanley? Uh, I consider <clears throat> there has to be a tie. Okay. Gene for the vision, and Bill for executing the plan. Okay. One what? without the other wouldn't have happened. Okay, and, and and so did you sense that from the very first time you stepped in a studio with them that Gene really had a clear vision of where we're going, or was he sort of on a learning curve, going okay, and then nope, finally he had he knew 
He knew. Uh, <clears throat> okay. He knew. And and quite frankly, uh, there's a great book out that Ken Sharp just wrote. Did you read it? Yeah, Nothing to Lose. Yeah. And it's brilliant. It's brilliant because it's really written by Gene and Paul. It really is, yeah. It, it, it's a bunch of quotes from everybody that's worked with the band. And, I mean, how many people know that Gene wanted to call the band Fuck? Yeah. You I, know? I, I learned have, that, too. You know, and have 30,000 people screaming, Fuck! 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 <laughs> you know? <clears throat> but, I mean, the book is, is great, and it gives you the whole backstory of the band. And if you read it, you see they were a promoting machine. They delegated even little shitty shows like Hotel Diplomat and, you know, all the Coventry. They promoted the crap out of it. <coughs> you know? Yeah, they really did. You know, going back to the Hotel Diplomat and those shows, um, did, were they in the same league as the New York Dolls and the Brats and all those? Or, or could you really tell, no, this is really a cut above? Or a cut they below? Were considered, they were considered in the same league insofar as being, you know, New York upstarts. You know what I mean? Another New York rock band like the right. Dolls and the Brats. But the Dolls and the Brats and all those bands came to see Kiss when they played because of the extravagant stage outfits and, you know, stuff like that. Perfect. So, you but know, they were good. They were really good. I saw them at Coventry, and they were really, really good. Yeah, Kiss. You know, it's a, it's a great band. Now, listen, we we we've we've been at this for an hour. Uh, oh we, wow! Why don't we go back to the beginning and quickly just plug? <clears throat> where where can people email you to to find out about the Cool School? And 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 let's just plug the website again. And uh, you know, great. It's called one word. The cool. It's called the Cool School. For Music Business Studies, you can email us at coolschoolbiz at yahoo.com. Okay. You can call 818-376-1380, or you could go to the website at http colon slash slash www.thecoolschool.biz, and you could get all the information you need about how you as a musician can get the business tools you need to succeed for only $20 a lecture. I see that. And that, that's wonderful. And let me just check the spelling on that. It, it's normal cool school. It's not with a S-K-O-O-L or anything. I mean, it's just cool. It's all, it's all lowercase one word. But it's, it's, so it's, it's the cool school as one word. Okay, but it's school spelt the normal way, right? There's no, there's no, no everything's spe- normal. Okay, no funky spelling. Okay, perfect. Kenny, you know, thank you very much. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, and listening to these stories, you know, um, it, it just adds to the whole kiss to re, as they like to call it. Uh, yeah. Know, it's it it and it's nice to hear from somebody that was there and and listen again as a fan of of the band and as a fan of of those two albums I I got to thank you I mean uh, th- those two albums were, were part of my life and have been for forty years and uh, oh yeah you know they they sort of define me you know I I don't know what I would do if I didn't have songs like Firehouse or Strutter or or even Parasite in my life you know you, you did a great job yeah. and thank you. Well, you're very welcome. They mean a lot to me, and uh, <clears throat> they wouldn't have lived unless we give credit to the real heroes, which is the Kiss Army. Absolutely. For supporting the band, for buying the records, for filling every seat at concert halls around the world. Absolutely. And for um, continuing to keep the fires lit. Uh, and this band is going to be around for another 40 years, entertaining people every second of the way. Oh, absolutely. The, the, I think the KISS legacy will, will go on far beyond any of our lives. I, I think uh, there's going to be another 40 or 50 years of, of fans growing up and hearing about KISS easily. I, I'm waiting to see Children of KISS. KISS 2.0, you know? as we call it. Well, you mentioned, right. four, you, know, you mentioned Foreigner before. I've seen them twice in my life, in the last two years, actually, and not once have I seen an original member in the band. So really, 
That's right. Mick, uh, Mick was, was sitting out the two shows I saw. So a foreigner can do it and still, you know, have a 2,500-seater place filled to capacity. KISS 2.0 exactly. is, is easily imaginable and doable, I think. Hey, let me ask you a question since you questioned me for the last hour. Sure. What do you think about Dean and Paul not allowing Peter and Ace on the uh, induction ceremonies at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Um. Well, you know, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing is really uh, a big mess. I mean, obviously, Ace and Peter have to be there. I mean, there's no question about that. But They're not going to be allowed. Yeah, but <coughs> I, I wish that, you know, I, I really blame the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Their definition, I think the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is trying to cash in on a KISS reunion. And I think the only people who deserve to cash in on a KISS reunion are the original four guys. And, uh, you know, the, the, they, they let the Grateful Dead have, I think, you know, 25 members. And they let, you know, all these other bands have all kinds of... Right. And, and I don't think we would be talking about KISS in 2014 had Eric Carr not come in and been very competent in replacing Peter. I don't think that the KISS legacy would have continued had Bruce Kulick had not come in and, you know, just kept the ship afloat. So, right. um, uh, I, I'm not upset with Gene and Paul. I, I, and you know what? Kiss has always been about doing what you believe in. And, and I, quite frankly, I would prefer if they stayed home and just boycotted the Hall of Fame induction ceremony altogether. Because as a fan, I don't need some guy from Rolling Stone magazine telling me Kiss is cool. I already knew that. So, I could understand. I could understand them uh, not performing with the band live right. at the ceremony. Right. But I cannot understand them not being on stage, being inducted, because there was no kiss without those two guys. Oh, I agree. Yeah. No, they absolutely. Uh, Ace and Peter absolutely deserve to be on that stage and pick up the whatever the right. trophy, the piece so of paper. So let them pick up the plaque or the award. Right. And then when Kiss performs. It's the current band. Right. And everybody's happy. Right. Except the Hall of Fame doesn't want that, and right. what are you going to do? But, you know, what? KISS has been, has been a part of my life for, you know, 35 years, I guess. I wasn't there right at the beginning, but, um, you know, they don't need the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're going to sell out shows across the states with Def Leppard this summer, and it's not because Jan Wenner or Dave Marsh gave them a little trophy or a little plaque that that's going right. to make a difference. Right. You're absolutely right. So, you know. So, again, you know, thank you for your time. And uh, let's, let's, let's do a part two at some point. And let's get fans out there to check out the coolschool.biz. Just give me a call. We'll do part two whenever you like. Thanks for the Great. opportunity, man. Thank you.